This next presentation is extraordinarily timely given the events in Minnesota. While many watching the trial of Derek Chauvin focused on his actions, the actions or inaction of the other bystander officers on the scene were also foremost in our minds. Most officers know what they should be doing, but many don't know how to do it safely and effectively. In this presentation, Jonathan Arney introduces the Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement Project, also known as ABLE. It's an innovation of the Georgetown University Law Center. Mr. Arney is a partner at Shepard Mullen, a global 100 firm handling corporate and technology matters in high stakes litigation. He leads the firm's government contract, investigations, and international trade practice group, and is chair of the Georgetown Law Shepard Mullen ABLE Project Board of Advisors. Please welcome Jonathan Arney. Hi, I'm Jonathan Arney, and uh, I'm here to chat with you a bit about a program called ABLE, the Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement Project at the Georgetown University Law Center. We're very excited that Project ABLE has partnered with the FBI NA Associates Program. Uh, and over the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to walk through what the ABLE project is. We're going to walk through what the partnership with the NAA is. And we're going to walk through uh, even some of the successes we've had in this, uh, with this program already. But I think we should probably start by explaining what ABLE is, what Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement is. The, the ABLE project, which is housed at the Innovative Policing Program at the Georgetown University Law Center, is, is a program that focus, focuses on evidence-based strategies and tactics that empower and educate police officers on how to intervene in another police officer's conduct. Two, do three things. Intervene to prevent misconduct. Intervene to reduce mistakes and intervene to promote officer health and wellness. And the ABLE project is designed to not just authorize, but empower officers to intervene in another officer's conduct, regardless of rank, and, and to teach the practical skills to do so successfully, effectively, and safely, and respectfully, and to make sure that a culture develops that, that protects officers who do ever have to intervene. <clears throat> the ABLE concept was actually born in New Orleans, and it was uh, created by the men and women of the New Orleans Police Department working hand-in-hand -hand with community members and academics, uh, including a very noted psychologist, Dr. Irvin Staub. And, and uh, the New Orleans Police Department created this prior program in uh, 2015, and they've been using it for years. Um, but it never really had a national stage. Well, uh, following the killing of George Floyd, the New Orleans Police Department and I probably received 100 calls from police agencies, police officers, and community members from across the United States asking for this program. And, and we, knew, we knew the time was right to give that intervention program a national home. And that national home is what became ABLE, Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement. ABLE as a national brand, if you will, has existed since July 2020 now. We have over 100 agencies in the program. Uh, we've trained over 350 police officers who, who are now certified to go back to their agencies and train on ABLE in their agencies. The 100 agencies cover 30 states, and they range from you know, a small 10-person campus police agency to a 35,000 person, uh, New York City Police Department. So the growth of ABLE has, quite, has been kind of inspiring and astounding. Before we get into the details of kind of how it works, just a couple of things that I think are worth taking note of. One, this program is supported by police officers and the civil rights, social justice community. I, in fact, I've, I've been working in, in 
you know, the area of policing for a long, long time, even though I'm not an officer, I've been working uh, side by side with police officers for more than 10 years. And, and I don't think I've ever come upon a program that is as passionately supported by police officers as it is by the community members. And that's, that's very empowering and, um, and energizing. It also is so timely because it's designed to prevent harm to community members and police officers now. It's designed to prevent problems before they arise. And, and thus, th this training is so different from, from other trainings that focus on you know, what happens after the fact. Um, and, and it's important to understand, in that sense, what, what ABLE is, which we've talked about, but also what ABLE isn't. Uh, the ABLE project, like I said, focuses on interventions to prevent harm before that harm takes place. But what it isn't is it's not an internal affairs program. It's not a discipline program. It's not a whistleblowing program. It's not a mediation program. It's not a reporting program. In fact, ABLE doesn't change reporting obligations at all. ABLE will prevent matters from occurring that end up in front of internal affairs. Is the ABLE skills are designed to stop the problems before they occur. Now, the program focuses on interventions in three settings. And I mentioned them briefly early on. It's intervention skills to prevent misconduct, intervention skills to prevent mistakes, and intervention skills to promote officer health and wellness. Now, I know we can all picture how an intervention could prevent misconduct, how an intervention could prevent harm to a community member, because sadly we see that on the news all the time, or at least more often than we'd like to. I want to share one of the case studies from the program that highlights how the same intervention skills can be used to prevent mistakes, mistakes by good officers. Um, the, the training itself, even though ABLE is not just training, but the training portion of ABLE starts with three case studies. And, and the case studies are all real. These things really happen. We've changed the names, but, but these case studies follow the students throughout the entire ABLE training. They, they are used throughout the training. And I want to share one of the case studies with you right now. And, and, and it's a case study that highlights the mistake prong of how active bystandership can be so critical for officers. And, and here's what happened. I'm going to give you the, it's the, the, the quick version of this case study. So back in 2015 in a big city in the United States, uh, a serious call came into 911. It was a domestic violence call. And a guy shot a gun in the direction of his girlfriend during a, a, a domestic argument. And it, was a, it was a child in the house. Uh, it was a pretty serious matter. She ran out of the house and called the police. She called 911. 911 then dispatched, I don't know, maybe 10 officers to the scene. They met the woman at the scene, and she told them that the suspect, we'll call him Steve Smith, was in the back room of this little row house. So a field training officer, a very senior FDO at that, went in with three younger officers, his rookie and two also young officers. And they make their way to the back of the house. They, they find a gun in the kitchen and they take the gun. And uh, they, they, they get to the back bedroom and they find Steve Smith in bed. The, the FTO then grabs him out of bed. And uh, Steve Smith is like, he's fussing and cussing and screaming at his girlfriend. And he's kind of half bent over as though he's in pain. The room's a mess. And, and the FTO gets him out, and the FTO puts the handcuffs on him, but he puts the handcuffs on palms together instead of palms to the outside. And, and that's certainly not how anyone was taught at this police academy. And it, in fact, violated the policy of how you handcuff someone, but that's the way he did it. And none of these three junior officers corrected him. After all, this guy's the FTO, right? The FTO then does a little pat down, but no search just a quick pat down. And none of these three officers in the room with him correct that either. They take Steve Smith out of the house, they get outside, there's probably, like I say, around 10 officers milling about, and a new officer, Officer Clarence Green drives up to take Smith to jail. They put him in the back of Clarence's car and no transfer search. Nobody searches Steve Smith again either. And no one says a thing about it. Well, I suspect you know where this horrible case study is going, but 
gets in the car, closes the door, heads off to lock up. And halfway to lock up, Steve Smith gets his arms out from the back under his legs and in front of him. He, uh, because the handcuffs were wrong, he reaches in his waistband and takes out a nine millimeter because the search was bad. And he reaches through the partition and he shoots Clarence Green twice above the vest and kills him. Uh, the car crashed. Smith escaped. Horrible, horrible story. Clarence Green was a great, great officer, a family guy as well. And we start with that case study in this course for, for some very important reasons. You know, and one of them is we've all seen the videos from the George Floyd killing, and, and you can't help but watching those and say to yourself, and certainly the community says this, you shouldn't have to teach this. You shouldn't have to teach that to anyone. We should just know. But, but how do we explain this one, right? How do we explain 10 officers, any of whom would have run into a gunfight to save Clarence Green's life, but not one of them could correct the FTO in something as simple as a bad handcuffing or a poor search or the lack of a transfer search. And, and every one of those officers, when they were at the academy, Every one of those officers practiced, say, being in a gunfight. And they practiced it over and over because you need it to be muscle memory. And that's a good thing. But what's interesting is not one of those officers, when they were at the academy, ever practiced or even visualized how to say to a senior officer, hey, dude, those, hand those handcuffs are on wrong. Or, or hey, that search wasn't good. And, and we know people play like they practice. We know... People shy away from things they're not comfortable doing. For decades in this country, we have taught bystandership by just demanding compliance with a policy. And that's been unfair to the community and unfair to the police officers. ABLE is all about changing that. ABLE is about learning the science of why people do intervene and why they don't. ABLE is about learning practical skills to make interventions more effective. And ABLE is about creating a culture where interventions are expected and frankly, even rewarded. Now, lest anybody think this is pie in the sky, it's not. The New Orleans Police Department has been doing this for years very, very successfully. And the 100 police agencies we already have signed up are absolutely passionate about bringing it to their agencies. So if we were in class now, of course we're not, but if we were, um, we would now ask you, tell us a little bit about the inhibitors to intervention in a police context. In other words, thinking back to that case study I just started with, where Clarence Green lost his life, why didn't those 10 officers intervene? Right? What, what inhibited them from intervening? Now, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor here, because obviously we're not together in person, although that would be nice. I'm going to ask you to quickly grab a pencil or a pen and make a list as you know, I'm going to give you 15 seconds to make a list of all the inhibitors to intervention you can think of. To be specific, think of that case study, ask yourself why those officers might not have intervened and write them down. Or, you know, think of, the, think of something you've seen on TV. Think of Rodney King. Think of George Floyd. Think of any time you've seen a police officer not intervene. I want you to make a list of what was inhibiting those officers. Now, assuming some of you have, have uh, taken me up on my offer and did that, in class, we would be now having a very robust discussion about what's on the officers' lists. And the officers usually get them all. What's interesting is, is they know them, but they've never really been exposed to how much social science there is behind these inhibitors. And I'm sure some of the ones on your list <clears throat> included things like a fear of retaliation a fear of exclusion by fellow officers, a fear of being ostracized. Some of you probably had just a fear of misunderstanding the situation. Well, maybe I don't know the right thing to do. I bet some of you on your list had hierarchy and chain of command. Others of you might have had things like, it's not my job, or something we call diffusion of responsibility. There, there's other people in the room. Why aren't they correcting? Why should I correct them if they're not correcting? Now. We don't have time to kind of go through the whole uh, exercise here, but, but what we do in class is, is we then take that list and then we focus on 
why these things are happening. And we also focus on the things that aren't on the list. Uh, for example, you know, sometimes the inhibitors are really ugly. Sometimes the inhibitor is biased. Maybe you're biased against you know, the gender or the race of the person being hurt. Maybe you're biased against the police officer. You know, maybe your view is, well, you know, he should get what's coming to him. Sometimes the inhibitor could be just outright racism or misogyny. The point is there are a number of inhibitors as to why any professional doesn't intervene. None of this turns out to be unique to policing. And that's such an important part of this program here because ABLE, ABLE doesn't talk about bystandership as, as a uniquely police skill. ABLE talks about bystandership as a human skill. And the inhibitors as human inhibitors that all people have trouble overcoming. <clears throat> and, and if you, if you don't believe me, I'll give you a couple of quick examples here. You know, for decades in this country, surgeons in hospitals have made all sorts of mistakes. And, and we couldn't get the nurses and the other doctors in that operating room to intervene to correct the mistake. Now, we asked the students in class, why is that? And, and they always come up with the answer. So I'm asking you, shout it out to yourself, even though I can't hear you. But why? Why wouldn't the nurses and the doctors intervene as a surgeon's about to make a significant error? Well, we know those answers, right? There's a hierarchy there. There's, there's, a, there's a disparity in knowledge. There's a culture that has pretty much said, don't correct the surgeon. There's a little bit of a God complex going on. When, when we go through, when we go through these things, things in class, the officers very immediately see all the parallels to policing. But what's interesting is the medical profession deliberately went about solving their bystander problem by implementing deliberate active bystandership training. The airline industry, very similar thing. Pilots would make errors and we couldn't get co-pilots to intervene on the pilots. Why, why is that? We've seen a similar thing on college campuses. There'd be you know, a sexual assault about to happen and, and multiple people watched. You know, let's just stereotype here, the drunk guy and the drunk girl going up the stairs at a party. And people watched that but didn't intervene. Why? All the inhibitors are the same. And if, you know what? The inhibitors are the same in the law, in my profession, legal profession, medicine, clergy. We need to stop thinking that active and passive bystandership are unique to policing. We need to start teaching it like it's, it's unique to humanity and focus our attention on practical skills and tactics to overcome those inhibitors. So here's how we go about doing that in the active bystandership law enforcement program. First of all, an agency has to apply to be part of this program. It's not just a PowerPoint you read. You don't just get to tell your community, oh, I've trained in a duty to intervene and then put it on the shelf. ABLE's about cultural change. And cultural change starts with a commitment of the agency to want to be part of ABLE. So those 100 agencies I've mentioned, they all committed to ABLE's 10 standards, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the other thing they all did to demonstrate their commitment, and they had to do this, this is the price of admission, if you will, is they submitted a letter from the police chief or the sheriff commit, you know, committing the agency to, to embrace ABLE. They submitted a letter from the mayor confirming that the police department or sheriff's office is truly on board. And then very importantly, two letters from community groups. And those community groups are vouching for the sincerity of the agency. When I look over the course of these last months and the community groups that have submitted letters of support for their agencies, it's, I've used this word before, but I'll use it again, it's inspiring. We've had multiple letters from NAACP chapters, multiple letters from Urban League chapters. We had one agency that submitted a letter of support from Black Lives Matter. We've had letters from churches and synagogues, boys clubs and girls clubs. Um, and that in itself already starts a conversation with your community, uh, even before you're in the ABLE project. <clears throat> now, once the agency is in the ABLE project, they then um, 
get trained in a couple of different ways. One way they get trained is they send officers to a train the trainer event. Uh, it's virtual, it's held by the Georgetown University Law Center. And those officers then get trained in this week long event who go back and now they're certified to train the whole agency. Other agencies who might not wanna go this route though have a different opportunity. And this comes from our partnership with the FBI National Academy Associates Program. We've partnered with the FBI NAA to train uh, between 10 and 25 at-large FBI NAA ABLE instructors. And these instructors are certified to teach the ABLE training to an agency that doesn't have its own instructors. So now agencies that want to be part of ABLE but don't say have enough personnel to send to the train the trainer event, there's still another path, thanks to the FBI NAA, to become an ABLE agency. The training itself, I said the train the trainer event is a week. The training itself is an eight hour training. And it has to be given to every police officer or sh sheriff's deputy, every law enforcement officer in the department from the chief sheriff on down. Everybody gets it. No one gets to have, you know, no one gets to say, well, I'm on the command staff, thus I only want a summary. No, everyone gets the exact same eight hour training. It also, part of the program is also, it's two hours annual in-service after that. And importantly, the principles of ABLE are also incorporated into other academy classes where it makes sense. So for example, not only is there the eight hour ABLE training, but the concepts of active bystandership get incorporated into use of force training and get incorporated into report writing. So now we've talked about two of the standards that any agency would have to commit to. One is the four letters of support, and the other is training exactly as it's been designed, consistent with the curriculum full fidelity to the model. Some of the other standards are, the agency has to have a project manager to make sure that ABLE is implemented properly. This isn't a new person you have to go and hire, it's you use someone that's in your department already. But having a project manager helps ensure accountability. It helps make sure no one is ever using ABLE as window dressing. Some of the other standards, and you can find these all online on the ABLE website, and we'll, we'll, we'll post that for you all. You have to have a respectable officer wellness program. You have to participate in a perception survey that the Georgetown Law Center puts out. You have to promote program awareness. There has to be tone at the top. In fact, what's very interesting is some of the agencies who have gone through the ABLE program, uh, just to name two, Rockwall, Texas, and Dearborn, Michigan did this, they actually sent their police chiefs to be the first two people to be certified trainers. You know, now, I don't expect that the chiefs are going to go back and teach ABLE courses every day in their departments, but what a remarkable way to demonstrate tone at the top by having the chief be able to say, oh, I not only had the eight-hour training, I've had the week-long training. I'm a certified ABLE instructor. And, and that's the sort of tone at the top that, that really feeds into a program like ABLE. When we talk about why this is so transformational and we talk about why so many agencies are gravitating toward it, including, by the way, the entire state of New Jersey, the, um, the Attorney General of New Jersey has now directed that every officer in that state receive ABLE training um, this year, which is very impressive. But when we ask ourselves why people are gravitating to it, we have to say, well, who are the stakeholders here, right? Who, who, who are the folks that this is so important to? And, and I think there's a bunch of them. Now, first of all, it's the community, right? The community, the community is tired of what they're seeing on television and on the internet and in the news. The community wants to trust the police officers. They know that most police officers are good, but we're living in a really tough time right now. And we need to do something that not only prevents harm to the community, but something that rebuilds the community's trust in policing. Another stakeholder, of course, is law enforcement itself. Remember, ABLE is about mistakes, misconduct, and officer health and wellness. You all know the horrible statistics about officer suicide. And yet your profession, like my profession, the legal profession, 
we don't know how to have those conversations with our colleagues. So, so we do things like when, when we see a colleague going down a bad mental health path, we, we do things like, come on, I'll take you out for a drink, forget about it, which obviously isn't good. The skills able teachers are skills that help you intervene on a colleague that's having a mental health issue as much as it does to help you intervene on a situation involving misconduct or mistake. So the goal of ABLE is to prevent harm to the community and just as much prevent harm to officers themselves. Other stakeholders include your departments and your governments, your local government. With a skill like ABLE, most people believe it's gonna cut down on misconduct and mistakes and thus it's gonna cut down on lawsuits. It's gonna cut down on protests. All this is a very realistic outgrowth of very deliberately teaching the skills of bystandership. Yet another stakeholder, frankly, is your business community. We, we have seen chambers of commerce and business community come to ABLE and say, hey, how do I get my agency involved? Like, we want our agency to be an ABLE agency. And that's really cool to see so many people getting together. You, you can actually look at the website and you can see the list of organizations that have come out in support of the ABLE project. And it's a, it's a very, very cool list. <clears throat> After our programs, we asked the officers who go through it, you know, what they thought and uh, what they learned. And we try to get some feedback. And I'm, I wanna share just a couple of these with you here because look, obviously I'm, I'm not a police officer. So, you know, you, you don't wanna take this from me. Um, but, but here's what, you know, here's what we hear back from the officers who go through the program. This was, uh, and this is just a couple, we have, we have hundreds of them. Uh, this came from a deputy in, uh, in Cincinnati. He says, uh, as a road deputy, this training will help me and my peers to change the mindset of the public and win back the trust that law enforcement so rightly deserves. We had an officer, and actually this was a, a, union, a union president and an officer who took the training uh, this is from a New York agency. He says, at first, I did not believe this topic would be embraced by my officers at all. But now, after my training, I feel that these concepts could actually be the cornerstone of teamwork and morale building for the officers of my department and many others. We have similar comments from executives, academy directors, but, but the one I just want to leave you with there is one that came from a social activist in New Orleans. This gentleman would describe himself as never having missed a police protest in his life. And here's what he had to say about Abel. He said, active bystandership creates stories that will never be told because nothing happened. And that's a pretty powerful comment from a person who has never supported policing in anything before. And now here he is an ardent supporter right alongside police officers, police leadership, and police unions, all supporting the same thing. That's kind of this magic sauce that we, we don't really see that often in this country anymore. So how can you help? Well, one, if you're interested, you can go to the ABLE website and you can learn more about ABLE. Uh, we would love to have your agencies come join us on this transformational journey. Two. If you're interested, but you're not so sure your department understands it, then reach out to us and ask us to put on a free executive session for your agency. In fact, we use our partners at the FBI NAA to put on some of these executive sessions and they're one to two hours. They're very powerful, very informative. And we have found that, uh, that your command staff and your leadership learns an awful lot from these and typically ends up applying to be part of ABLE the next day. There's also opportunities for your community to become involved because remember, you can't get in without support from at least these two community groups. So another opportunity to kind of get community and police talking again and working together again. I, I very much want to thank you all for spending some time with me today. I, I hope you're interested in learning more I obviously can't quite do it justice in 25 minutes, but, um, but our team is happy to chat more with anyone who's interested. And that team includes the Georgetown University Law Center, where ABLE sits. ABLE sits at Georgetown's Innovative Policing Program. 
Uh, the other co-founder is my law firm, Shepard Mullen. I'm very proud of Shepard that we provided the seed money to get this off the ground. Also, it's important to tell you, and I waited to the last second because uh, no one believes me when I say it, but ABLE is free to agencies. Uh, we do this for free. We do it because it's transformational, and we do it because there are a few other things that police and community both support. And so I do every hour I put into this, I do all pro bono, as do my colleagues at my law firm. I already told you about the partnership with the FBI NAA. We're very excited about, and that's going to continue to grow. Uh, as a side note, by the way, we have just absolutely been thrilled with the quality of the FBI NAA instructors that have come through the program, and they are working their way to become full instructor trainers. There are also some other uh, supporters we have beyond the community groups listed on the website. We have received just uh, priceless, if you will, support from some pretty impressive corporations. So MasterCard and PepsiCo and Verizon came on board as full gold sponsors so we can keep this free. HNI and Dentsu and Toyota and Granger have also come on board to help us keep this free. So this really has been a group effort. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to be the chairperson of the board of advisors, but I'm always humbled by the people I'm working with, the police officers, uh, our board of advisors is filled with police officers, rank and file, and leadership working right alongside academics and community members. So please reach out to us. We're going to put the website on your screen. We'll put some email addresses up. You can reach out to us. You can reach out to Georgetown. You can reach out to uh, the FBI, NAA, and we hope to see you as part of the ABLE family soon.